الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا إلى أحسن الأخلاق السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we just finished uh, reciting uh, the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah. So when, when did Ramadan finish? When was Eid? April 23. April 23. So it's been like a, a, a month and a week. And Alhamdulillah, we finished six juz and a quarter. So we're on a good pace to finish the Quran, inshallah. All right, guys. Uh, I'm doing a khatma in Isha and Fajr and Maghrib. So uh, we can celebrate more than one khatma through the year. For anyone who's following along, so they know. We finished Surah Al-Ma'idah. So we're starting Surah Al-An'am in Fajr, inshaAllah. Um, today's lesson is about mannerisms that a person should have and etiquettes at the time of wedding. Uh, wedding manners, basically. Uh, wedding of, weddings, of course, it's part of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Having a wedding party is, is part of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Having an event and a party, it's part of the Sunnah. May Allah grant all of the Young guys here, uh, you know, wives. I mean, uh, is it just work? I said just one. Huh? What about the wives? beautiful wives? Yes, of course, of course. What about the old men? The old men? Yeah. Halas, your time is done. <laughs> you have to save some for the rest. Astaghfirullah. Subhanallah. I was just. Uh, should I mention it? I'll mention it. Ibn Hajar, uh, one of the great scholars who wrote the very famous commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, Fath al-Bari, it's very well known, okay? Ibn Hajar, I just read today that at the age of 63, he, he married someone at the age of 33. And, he, uh, and so he was like, he was away from her for a long time and he started writing poetry. And so <laughs> some of that is still, uh, you know, recorded till this day. Um, if someone invites you to a wedding, you should accept the invit invitation. Unless you are aware, again this book is by Shaykh Abdul Fattah, unless you are aware, it may include prohibited acts. Of course, you, as we all live in the West, not every wedding is going to be abiding by Sharia guidelines. You know? Some you might be able to you know, work around and attend, but some are just explicitly haram. For example, if you go to an event that you are invited to by uh, for perhaps one of your non-Muslim co-workers or non-Muslim friend, and you know for... Like you should not like completely disappear and be like, I'm not going. Maybe just be respectful, show up, give your thing and then just leave. But to stay there and be a part of that event and, and, and see the dancing of the woman and hearing the loud music and seeing all of that and seeing them get drunk, that's not permissible. That is not permissible. Uh, but if you're going to a Muslim wedding, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Uh, attending a wedding, a wedding, as I said, is part of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallu Um so if someone invites you, it's, it's kind of like their right as a Muslim that you attend the walima. You know, if someone invites you to a walima, you have to go unless you have an actual excuse or a reason not to. Um, Islam actually endorses performing the marriage ceremonies in the mosque. Uh, and there's a hadith that aid this, and that's why the second phase is actually going to come in very handy for all of the you know, events and stuff like that. Aqiqahs, walimas, you know, obviously extension for the musalla. Uh, for whatever events happen. Uh, so Islam actually does encourage having the walimas at the masjid. There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is in uh, Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. Announce the marriage, execute it at the mosques, and celebrate it with drums. So you know the daf. So you can celebrate it with... Uh, a lot of people, they think that Muslims, you know, at least the ones that are very religious, they think that their, their wedding should be dull. No, who said it should be dull? Weddings are not supposed to be boring and dull. Muslims are supposed to be celebrating. They're supposed to be dancing. They're supposed to be deaf. They're supposed to be singing and you know all of these things. But with Sharia guidelines, you see, that's the main thing. But is it okay? Can Muslims dance? Can I? Let me ask you. Yes. yes. Is it haram to dance? No, it's not haram to dance. Who said it's haram to dance? Nobody said. Okay, alhamdulillah. It's not haram to dance. But again, it depends how you're doing it, of course, right? Um, like they do dabka, the Palestinians, they do dabka. And uh, even many, many different cultures, they have their own style. If you go into any Arab wedding, you'll find that they're dancing with the swords in Saudiya. And even Desis, we have our own culture, but sadly we're very influenced by Hindus. 
So sometimes we might go a little bit extra. But uh, generally, generally, you find that all weddings include some dancing, some singing, and stuff like that. So it's, a religious Muslim does not mean that he does not celebrate. You can also celebrate, but just within the guidelines of Sharia. Huh? It's the mixing that's the issue. That's the that's the main issue. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I'll I'll get into that. Uh, the difference between the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallu alayhi. He reports in uh, Tirmidhi Nasa'i ibn Majah the difference between a halal wedding, a halal relationship, and a haram relationship is its announcement with celebrations and drums. Right. The difference between you being in a haram relationship and a halal relationship is that you make your halal relationship, your wedding public. You announce it. You don't secretly go get married. Secret marriages are not marriages. I'm just letting you know. Secret marriages are not marriages. So uh, you have to what, announce it publicly and, you, uh, and celebrate it and do it with the drums and all of that. And there is no dispute amongst Muslim scholars that in a wedding celebration, the Prophet sallallahu allowed women to use drums. So women can use drums and the majority opinion is that men can also use drums at the time of wedding. Um, the purpose of making it public is to distinguish between an evil and illicit relationship and a noble and honorable marriage. Right? And a nikah is something, that you're basically announcing that we're now establishing a family. And you know, we want to make this public news. It's good, it's good. Right? You're building family and families build communities. So that's what makes a difference. Uh, what makes it different from a haram relationship. So we should be announcing our weddings and uh, hosting, of course, walimas. Attending a wedding is one of the duties of brotherhood amongst Muslims, of course. It fulfills the requirement of announcing and witnessing a marriage. Again, who knows the arkan of uh, a nikah? What do you need for a nikah to happen? You need a, a wali, okay? a woman's guardian. You need what else? Two witnesses. Two witnesses. And what else? Uh -huh. Huh? Uh -huh. Mahab, what else? Yeah, Mahab. And you need to do Ishhar, you need to tell people as well. Right? These are like the Arkan uh, of, of Nikah. You need to have two witnesses. And if everyone is coming, then everyone is witnessing, not just two people. Huh? Oh, Ijab and, ijab and Qabul as well, of course. Mutual, uh, mutual consent. That's not true. People who understand this, is, it's, it's wrong. In the Hanafi Madhab, um, they have a shart, it's called kafa'a, meaning that the woman and man, they have to be uh, compatible with each other. If they're not compatible, then they cannot go and marry off without a wali. Uh, basically, in the Hanafi madhab, uh, people they have this misunderstanding that a woman doesn't need her guardian to get married. It's true in certain cases, meaning if they have a similar background, their wealth status is the same, their religious status is the same, in that case, if all of those conditions are met, then she doesn't need her wali, but it's still encouraged. But the rest of the madahib, and this is the opinion that I push for, is that they need, the woman needs a wali, she needs a guardian, because the guardian acts as a caretaker. You know, you don't know. Let me tell you this, women are very, they have terrible judgment when it comes to men. A man knows what a man is like, right? So as you as a father or a, or a brother, or someone who takes that position in, in that woman's life, you can be that filter for her. That this person, I know stuff about him that you just don't want to know. You know? So it's important for a woman to have a wedding. Uh, the manners of attending weddings. The intention that we should have, of course, is to follow the Prophet wasallam to attend this blessed occasion and delightful celebration. Also, it's important that we dress appropriately for this joyous, joyous occasion. The Prophet ﷺ's companions, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, whenever they go to visit each other, they dress, uh, they dress nice. So if you're going to visit someone's house, you know, you get invited to a house, you get invited to a wedding, of course they're going to dress nice. But something that's important is some people, they, they go and they outdress the bride and groom. That's also not appropriate, you know. It's not your day to celebrate. Yes, you dress nice, but you know, like for some, for like, this is like an unspoken rule amongst women, my, my wife was saying this, that if it's not your wedding day, you're not allowed to wear white. Like you cannot be going to someone else's wedding and wear white dress. You cannot, uh, just like an unspoken rule amongst women, right? And similarly, if you're a man or if you're a woman, don't go and try to outdress the bride and groom. Go wear nice clothing, man. You don't, gotta, you don't have to swag out on that day. You do it on some other day, you know? 
Don't, you don't have to do it on the day of someone else's wedding. Uh, if you initiate or, or share in a talk with someone, you know, when you're sitting and you're, you know, you're at the event, make sure it fits the happy occasion. Do not talk about depressing things and distasteful subjects, right? It's a happy event. Talk about happy things. Don't talk about, uh, you know, distasteful or depressing things that would spoil the occasion. You should, you know, Muslims should always be considerate towards uh, the event and where they are. Similarly, if you're at a janazah and you're at an aza, you know, <laughs> and you start smiling and you start making jokes, you're at an aza. People just lost someone that they love. You're at a janazah. People are crying and then you're going to be making jokes on the side. That's very, that's not the time for it, right? So, of course, a Muslim is always considerate. Uh, when, when they get married, you should congratulate the bride and groom by repeating what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallu alayhi what he said baraka, say with me baraka allahu lakuma wa baraka alaykuma wa jama'a baynakuma fi khayr okay that is uh, from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Islam he, uh, Islam permits women to celebrate weddings by singing joyous songs of course this is a woman amongst women Accompanied by a drum beat, so women could be singing and they could be dancing. They could have the beat. They could have all of that, right? So long as it's, of course, if there's no ikhtilaf that's happening. Such poems and songs, though, that the songs that they're singing uh, should not promote lust or lewd things, right? Or portray physical beauty. It should just be delightful and decent songs to express their happiness with this marriage, right? Uh, any typical. Uh, uh, I don't want to say a typical song, but usually in Arab culture they have this really, they have this, uh, they have this. I, I haven't really seen like a, a religious, religious Desi wedding in my own life, so I don't know how it is personally. I mean, there, there are, they, they exist, they happen, but it's just not as common. And I personally have never witnessed it because uh, my family goes all out. <laughs> Can the singing be loud enough for it to be heard by men? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, why are the men hearing it? <laughs> Can the singing be loud enough? I mean, they should be in like their own... Yeah. Uh, instead, but if it's together, and that happens, you know, all the time, then they should just be careful as to the opposite gender being there and then um, having that in mind. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha said, a bride was led to her Ansari husband from the Ansar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallu alayhi, he then said, Oh Aisha, uh, did, you, did you not have merriment? Now, you know, like uh, sing songs and stuff like that. The Ansar, he said the Ansar love fun. He said the Ansar, they love fun. And so he was referring to the singing and beating of drums, of course, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Hajar, the same one who I just mentioned, who got married at 63, uh, in Fath al-Bari, he mentioned that Aisha radiallahu anha, she recalled that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Why did you not send with her a singer girl with a drum beat? You know, in a wedding. So like again, aiding the fact that it's permissible for women amongst each other to be singing and dancing and having a beat. That's totally permissible. And again, with men amongst men, that's also permissible. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Aisha said, singing what? He said, songs sung at weddings must be decent and contain similar wholesome and seemly meanings." Songs of lust, passion, and immorality should be avoided, right? Um, so that's just some of the adab. Let's, show, let's mention another. Uh, we should not be showing up uninvited. If someone does not invite you to something, you should not show up uninvited. Nor should you try to push them to invite you. Oh, you have to invite me to your You have to invite me. You know, some people, they say that. Oh, you're getting married. You have to invite me. That's not, that's not appropriate, you know? You never know the person's budget. You don't know the person's expenses. Maybe the guy doesn't like you, you know? You know, maybe you know him, but you don't know his children. His children are the one getting married. You know, so don't show up and invite it, and then don't push an invitation either. That's not appropriate. Um, uh, again, don't outdress the bride and groom. Don't just invite rich people. Sadly, this happens sometimes in very amongst very wealthy uh, community members. They might only invite rich people, and they don't invite those that are are poor. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Well, I believe this is a statement of Abu Hurairah, I'm not sure. He said, the worst food is the food in a walima, a wedding, you know, a wedding party, where the rich people are invited and the poor people are not. The poor people are not. 
right? So we should not just be, you know, like choosing people to invite based off of social status. I've seen this and I've attended weddings like that where they only invite very, very rich people, wealthy people, and they don't choose to invite, you know, people that are not as well off. Usually because they have it in these big, big halls. I've seen weddings where they have like, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and then months later they get divorced, you know? So we should not be extravagant. Another thing is that we should not be extravagant with our weddings. We can have a nice wedding and a nice venue, make it elegant, make it beautiful, but not to be overly, overly extravagant. That's not from Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, wala tusrifu, don't waste. And I, I can tell you how many times I've seen where couples, they'll do huge weddings and they end up getting divorced. I mean, think about that. You know, that's, that's such a, so sad, you know. So we should not be focusing so much on having this big wedding. Why don't you focus on having a big marriage? Like instead of spending so much money on your wedding, why don't you take some time off as a couple and go to a honeymoon, go do Umrah, go do Hajj, you know, along with of course celebrating your wedding. We should be more wise as to how we spend our money. Uh, sometimes, especially uh, sisters, they might want to have a big, big, big wedding. You can have a nice wedding, but to go overboard and extravagant is not the wise thing to do. It's better you take that money and actually invest it. You could perhaps use that as a down payment for your future house. You could buy a car, you could you know, invest into something. You could do so much more with that money than having this overly extravagant wedding. Um, and of course, when we invite people, we should be inviting our family members. We should not be stingy, we should invite our family members, our friends, we should invite those people. Uh, and you know, we, should, uh, we should be nice in the way we invite them. I'm like, oh yeah, I have a thing, you can, you can come. No, like, like give them ikram. When you're inviting someone, do it with ikram. An invitation card, you know, say, I really want you to come. You should, when you invite someone, you should do it with ikram. And of course, you should also invite righteous people. You should invite scholars. You should invite people of that so that they can make dua for you. And people in general should be also making dua for you. So, you should invite me, inshallah. <laughs> I'm kidding, please don't actually. <laughs> uh, do not imitate kuffal when it comes to weddings, when it comes to how they have the music playing and they have a DJ, and then they have the woman and men mixing around and they have like, you know, uh, for example, a photographer and then he may be taking pictures of women and stuff like that. And then you'll, that those pictures are gonna be saved in albums for how many years. You know, we have to be careful about these things, you know. Uh, we can have celebrations, we can have weddings, we can have parties, but within the boundaries of Islam, and if you choose to have, and if you do end up having a wedding where it is mixed, just be careful as to, you know, abiding by uh, those Sharia guidelines. If there's any akhlaq or adab that you guys think are very important to remember or mention at the time of weddings, anybody? Brother Tariq? Yeah. Bringing a gift. Bringing a gift, of course. Tahadu tahabu. You should bring a, a, a gift, of course. You should take a gift. Uh, an appropriate gift, don't be cheap and don't be stingy when it comes to bringing a gift either. Uh, you should be generous to them if they're hosting you and they're hosting all of these people. Of course, that's taking money out of their own pockets. So if you give a nice and generous gift and you help this family establish themselves, there's nothing wrong with that. It's very encouraged. Tahadu tahabu, giving a gift. Don't just show up. Yeah. Anything else? Not complaining about the food. Not complaining about the food, subhanAllah. You know, another hadith that we, uh, we covered of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if he did not like something, he would leave it. And if he liked it, he would eat it. He would never complain about food. So don't sit there and be like, oh, this, you know, the kebab is not that good, you know. People love complaining about wedding food, man. It's like, that's so bad. You should not be complaining about food in general, especially if someone invites you. So don't complain about the food. Any other adab? Right, speaking negatively of the wedding in general. Speaking negatively of the wedding. You should not be speaking negatively of the wedding, of course, or of others and what they do. Yeah. So generally be happy for the couple. Yes. So Yeah. Yeah. Not to be jealous. Yeah, not to be jealous. Not to be jealous and actually show joy for them. And if you're jealous, then you make dua for them. Any other adab that people should remember? For of course the clothes we wear, we should be making sure that we cover our awrah. We should be wearing things that are appropriate. Yes, we could dress nicely, but at the same time we have to abide by uh, Islam. Any other adab that we should remember? Oh, mashallah, mashallah. One thing I noticed some amazing like, weddings, 
Oh, praying salah, <laughs> yeah. Some people, they forget about praying salah at the time of weddings. So we should, of course, be praying salah. Uh, and also, you know, maybe one thing, this is not going to work out though, showing up on time. <laughs> this is something that everyone does not do. You know, the venue, there's a time frame where there's a time where you start and end. You should try to show up on time. It's not going to happen though. Everyone's going to keep showing up late. Anything else? Huh? Plan overnight stays? Oh. Oh. Like at some at, the, at their house and stuff like that. You mean? Oh yes, exactly. Oh no, do not be a burden on the person that's inviting you for the wedding, especially in big weddings. For example, you know, uh, Desi Arab and all. Um, I'm sure all all cultures where they expect the host to be treating you like you're the, the person getting married, you know? No, like, but get your own hotel, get your own car, try to, you know, try to help them, don't, make, don't be a, a burden on them. That's, yeah, you're right, very true. Any other adab or etiquettes? Yes. Okay. I need some new young guys too, come on, think you guys are about to get married, think of something. <laughs> so, uh, on the same line, at the same time, yeah. as a you know, community member, we should ask the host, Families, yeah. if they need any help. Oh, subhanAllah. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. They yeah. You should ask, you know, uh, the person that's hosting, do you need any help? And actually be, be genuine and sincere and asking and, and be of assistance in any way you can. I mean, especially when you host a, an event so large, you're going to be dealing with so many things. It's going to be almost impossible to do it all yourself. So if you have help from other family members, and for those that do not have big families where they live, then community members. The community becomes a family, you know? Any other adab? No? So the incident that you mentioned, uh, inviting only the rich. Yes. When I was little, I used to remember there was a wedding. Yeah. Right in front of their house, there was a owner of rickshaw club, you know? Yeah. Uh, he has a bunch of rickshaw. Yeah. So they invited everyone. Except the rickshaw people. This poor guy. So I felt even when I was that little, yeah. I felt terrible. That Wallah, it's so bad. Yeah, it's, it's so t it's so terrible. It's it's very common. It's very it's very common. So you were rich. No, I was not rich. Because you were invited a rich. Brother Akbar was at that wedding at the rich shop. I'm I'm Mimman, so you know Mimman's thing. <laughs> they invite each other. Mimmons are like the businessmen of Pakistan. <laughs> any other any other nothing? So different topic. Uh, mashallah, we have two brothers and sisters going for Hajj this year. Yeah. And the issue with this time, last year and this year, there is no Muallim. Yeah. And most of the people are on their own. Yeah. So it may be very appropriate that if you can teach us mm -hmm. that how to do the Hajj so mm -hmm. they don't struggle. Because okay. over there, they don't, most of us don't speak Arabic. Sure. So it may be a good idea. I, I, I've already been getting Hajj questions, so inshallah I can maybe do that. But if you no. can practically show what to do, how to do, inshallah. Okay, inshallah, do that. So basically, right now, we don't go to the group from the U.S. Yeah. So they decide who is the group. Yeah. No, no, it's a good idea. It's in the Hudson Ocean, I know. Oh, yeah. Last year, one, Parmes Malona. Yeah. He was invited to Hudson Ocean. Yeah. And 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 he was invited to Hudson Ocean. And he was invited to Hudson Ocean. Yeah. And he was invited to Hudson Ocean. Yeah. He had to call in Burma to ask his, his scholars there, other scholars, that how do I do this? How do I do this? Yeah. So maybe I, I mean, Hajj, I mean, you of course have to be a scholar, you've ha you, you have to study the fiqh, but I'm, I promise you, unless you do Hajj, you won't know what's happening. Because there's like Mina, Arafat, Muzdalifa, unless you're living it and you actually experience it, Alhamdulillah, I got to do Hajj five times. So I, I have a good idea of how to do Hajj, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and you learn, there's like, uh, you know, in Hajj, Everything goes like if you can find an, a minority opinion, you just take it uh, so long as it's ease you know, for, for the ease of the experience.